Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. There will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former times, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. The word of the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom then shall I fear? 
reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be in, united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters, what I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those that sat in the region and shadow of death, the light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if the lectionary was being willfully confusing or just decided that this series of Gospels last week and this week make sense. I don't know that they do. Last week we got one story about the calling of Andrew and Simon Peter. And this week we get another one and they differ a lot. Andrew and later Simon are pointed to Jesus by John in last week's gospel from the gospel according to John. John the Baptist points them to Jesus. And in this one, Jesus comes and seeks them out once he is back in Galilee. Remember, John was baptizing in the area of the Jordan, near Jezreel probably, down in the region of Judea, closer to Jerusalem. And, it, the, and the first thing we hear in today's gospel is that John has been arrested and Judea has become too hot politically for Jesus. And so he has gone home to Galilee, but not, not too close to home because you don't want to go home. Jesus needed to move out of the house. It was time. He was 30. He was ready to, move, to leave, to go out on his own. And so he left the hill country and Nazareth and he went to Capernaum to live by the sea. And in that place, he found a, a town that was both very Jewish and very Greco-Roman. You can see the place where a synagogue was if you go to Capernaum on the seashore, or you can see a Greco-Roman ruin of a temple. And both of those live and exist in Capernaum. And Jesus goes there, and that's where he begins to proclaim the gospel, the good news. Repent. The kingdom of God has come near to you. Jesus goes and begins to say that the kingdom of God has come near to you. And this is the crux. The, the center, the core of everything that Jesus will do in his life and his death and resurrection. All of the healing, all of the teaching, all of the parables, all of the passion, all of the crucifixion, all of the resurrection is based in this one idea. 
The kingdom of God has come near to you. God has come to you. God has sought you out. And this is both, both welcome and revolutionary. It's welcome because people in the first century aren't that much different than us. They look at their lives and often think, I wonder if there's more than this. There's, there's probably more than this. There's got to be more than this, right? Then what we have, and this world that we have been given with all of its strife and struggle and inequity, there's got to be more than this, right? And for Jesus preaching the kingdom of God has come near to you, it is welcome because Jesus' answer, God's answer in Jesus is yes, there is more than this. There is a whole nother kingdom, the kingdom of God. But it is also revolutionary. Because remember, it's not just Judaism that's there in Capernaum, it's also Roman. The Roman overarching social structure. Most especially the Pax Romana. The political structure that keeps a peace enforced by blood and a sword. That brooks no opposition to itself. And tells all of the people under that empire that you have to be ready to die for this peace. That we place this peace, we hold this peace above your life. We hold the control that we have asserted over the world that we know as more important than any of your lives. And Jesus comes saying, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This kingdom is for you. The Roman Empire isn't for you. You're for the Roman Empire. You are a cog in the wheel of the Roman Empire. But the kingdom of God is for you. You are part of the kingdom of God. You are a child in God's heart. That's what God's kingdom means. The Roman Empire means death and blood and the sword. It's a lot of other things too, but it's all enforced and based on that foundation. The kingdom of God is based on life and dignity and human flourish. And it stands in opposition to the foundation that the Roman Empire has been built on. And it is revolutionary. So that is what God is doing for us. Jesus comes and says, the kingdom of God has come near to you. That is the statement, the fact. But there's also the call to action. Jesus' message is in two clauses. Not just the kingdom of God has come near to you, but the call to action which comes first. Repent. Now we have 2,000 years of Christian social understanding of what repent means and some of you are probably thinking about how we have to kneel at um, the confession as repentance we say we repent our sins uh, and we have to kneel and that's maybe what you think of and maybe you think of something else much more like monty python the quest for holy grail with monks walking around smacking their foreheads with boards you think that's what repentance is or many other things but if we divest ourselves of all of those 2,000 years of ideas of what repentance might look like, what it really means is to turn back, turn toward. Jesus says, turn toward God for the kingdom of God is near you, near unto you. Turn around and face God because God is looking for you. Turn around and renew your relationship with God because you are part of God's family. Turn around, change your orientation to God. Be like a sunflower. If you drive through agricultural parts of our country for any length of time, you will drive by fields of sunflowers. We make a lot of sunflowers in the United States. You can tell because you go to any gas station. You can find bags upon bags upon bags upon bags of sunflowers. 
And if you drive through sun, by sunflowers a lot, which I did when I lived in Montana because there are places where that's the best thing to grow because there's lots of sun and not a lot of soil and that's where sunflowers flourish. Uh, you'll, and if you drive by these fields more than once in a day, you'll see the sunflowers move, right? They, when the sun comes up in the east, turn their heads to face the sun and follow it slowly throughout its course of the day until it sets in the west. And then at night, they release their head and they begin to reorient themselves so they're ready for the next morning. They turn again, turn back to the east, looking for the promise that the sun makes, that it will come back the next day. They reorient themselves. This is what it means to repent, to reorient ourselves again and again and again, not just once, but to be ready to do it over and over and over again. This is even a part of baptism. Right? It's a part we don't think about as much because it's right at the beginning and we don't do the things that we used to do with it. Right? So in the oldest traditions of the baptism, at the very beginning when we're, we're asking people if they renounce things, you know, renounce the spiritual for forces of weakness that rebel against God, etc., etc., and people say, I renounce them, I renounce them, I renounce them. And then we, we stop. And, and in the earliest church, when you were saying those renounces, you would have been facing west, either physically or liturgically. In this case, it's both. You would have been facing that way, toward the organ. And then, when I, if, if we were doing it the way they did it in the ancient church, when I asked, do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, Savior and Lord? The person to be baptized would physically turn themselves 180 degrees to face east. The rising sun, the altar, the presence of God among us. Before they said, I do. And then we asked them to make a covenant. That says, this is not a one-time thing. Remember the second promise of the baptismal covenant? Persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. This is a thing we are to do over and over and over again. That turning and reorienting ourselves so that we're always facing God. This is a thing we are to do and to do again and to do again and to do again. It is unavoidably part of being a Christian. Repent, turn back, have in yourselves the same mind that is in Christ. It's what Paul is trying to make the Corinthians understand in, the, in his letter today. He's so focused on preaching this news. Can't even remember who he baptized a couple weeks ago. No shame. I sometimes have trouble remembering whom I baptized and whom I haven't. So it's a common, common problem. But Paul is laser focused on preaching this good news and our response to it. The kingdom of God has come near to you. Repent, reorient, turn yourself to God. Turn yourself to life. And that means turning away from other things, the way things are. Oh, we can't change anything. This is the way things have always been. We've always done it that way. There's no, we're just a cog in the machine. We can't make any changes. Nothing can be done. It's just the way it is, turning away from everything we think we know to God who is full of possibility because God is full of life. When Jesus goes back to Nazareth having prepared himself to face the next three years of his public ministry, having been baptized by John, having seen what it may cost, what it will cost, and what happens to John the Baptist. Jesus goes back to Galilee to Capernaum by the sea and begins to preach. Repent. The kingdom of God has come near to you. God is seeking you. Turn from what you know or think you know. 
Turn from the things that make you feel hopeless and lifeless, unable to move. Turn to God and have life. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally God of God, from God to God, life from light, through God from through God, the God of the Mountain, the one being from the Father. Prayers of the People begin on page 9 of the service bulletin. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory to the world. Lord, in your mercy, Guide the people of this land and all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for Judy, Kathy, Kathy, Jenny, Scott, Sharon, Jean, Ken, 
Teresa, Mary, Marianne, Phil, Denny, and Bjorn. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Pray especially for Elizabeth. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess the sin against you in God's word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left among them. We cannot love you with our own heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not loved our neighbors as We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry that we have become a new man. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Almighty God, have mercy on you to give you all your sins to our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated for a moment. Welcome to all. We're glad you're here with us this morning. A few brief announcements I want to share with you. Uh, again, the, our annual meeting will be February 5th at 11.45 p.m.-ish. Depends on when this service on the 5th finishes. It should be, though, at 11.45 um, in the education building across the way. I hope that you will join us and hear about uh, the year that we've had uh, in 2022 and the year to, uh, to come and what God has in store for us. Uh, and after the annual meeting, I hope you'll join us downstairs in the parish hall for a chili cook-off uh, and lunch. Uh, if you have a chili recipe that you want to bring and share, whether it's your grandmother's secret recipe or it's the secret is that it's Hormel out of a can. Doesn't matter. Please bring it, share it. There will be a um, taste test by uh, some specially appointed judges, and um, they will award a winner who will receive a uh, a trophy for their uh, efforts. If you don't want to make chili, totally understandable. You, you can bring cornbread, pie, salad, anything else uh, to share with people as we um, celebrate our life together as the Church of the Redeemer on the day of our annual meeting. We hope that you will come. Uh, there are other announcements, uh, including 
uh, the date and time for Elizabeth Moses' funeral. It is February 11th at 2 p.m. Um, and you can find that and many more announcements in your font or in our online e-newsletter, the font, or in the bulletin, which is what I meant to say the first time. Uh, I hope you will uh, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest all those announcements and that we will see you back here very soon. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another. You have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.